Okay, um, I think I'll go ahead and get started. There's still a couple of people out, out in the uh, atrium, but uh, don't want to get too far off schedule here this morning. Uh, I'm Neil Leary. I'm the uh, director of uh, Dickinson College's Center for Sustainability Education. Uh, I want to welcome you here to, uh, to campus um, and to this workshop on teaching about climate change. Uh, when we sent out the invitation for this workshop back in uh, November, uh, we weren't quite sure what to expect uh, in, in a response. And we were really very pleased with the overwhelming response. Um, the weather has sort of dampened uh, the number of people who've shown up, but we had uh, 1.69 people registered to come from well over 20 different colleges and universities. And uh, we also have one K through 12 school um, as well uh, here. So we've got quite, a, quite an interesting group. We've got, most of them are from Pennsylvania. Uh, some of you come from Maryland, New Jersey, Massachusetts. I think some of you from Illinois. I don't know if they're here, but we have someone from Illinois sign up. So we've got quite a, quite a diverse group also in terms of disciplines uh, across sciences. Uh, social sciences and humanities. Um, so I think we're going to have an interesting morning and, and afternoon. Um, this workshop is uh, this is the, the final activity of a three-year project that Dickinson College has led in partnership with uh, um, a number of other schools uh, that NASA has funded out of their Innovations in Global Climate Change Education Program. Uh, the project is called Cooling uh, the Curriculum: A Campaign for Climate Change Education at uh, Liberal Arts Colleges. Um, and um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the purposes of, of that project. The primary purpose is basically to promote teaching about climate change across the curriculum. Um, so not just focusing in on the physical science issues, but really engaging with the social sciences and, and the humanities as well. Um, to sort of do this very broadly and not just, just in a few places within a, a college curriculum. Um, and doing this by um, creating and sharing um, good uh, teaching practices, um, um, uh, information resources, course syllabi, assignments, other teaching materials, um, and also by I think looking at, you know, we've run workshops in the past, uh, longer workshops have been week long, that were focused on building uh, faculty's capacity to um, engage themselves and their students in meaningful questions that extend beyond the disciplines in which we've been trained. Okay? That um, when you're you know, teaching a course in which climate change is part of the subject matter, it is common uh, that we find that, you know, um, well, we have training in a particular discipline and may be most comfortable uh, teaching about some selected aspects of this very broad, complex problem, our students don't respect disciplinary boundaries. Okay? You may be teaching your physical earth science course on climate change, but you're going to have students who are going to show up in that class, class who are going to ask questions about the economics and politics. And are you going to be comfortable and prepared to figure out how to deal with that, how to approach those, those questions? Uh, similarly, somebody who's teaching uh, in Tony's environmental economics class, um, you can't avoid students who are probably going to ask questions as you talk about, you know, if climate change is one of the examples you deal with, students are going to be saying, well, you know, there's all this stuff I see on Fox News, there's controversy about the science, what's, what's going on here? Um, so we really need to be able to, liberal arts institutions are good places, this is what we excel at, is finding ways to address these, these kinds of questions that really require us to be in conversation with people outside of, of the areas in which we've been trained. Um, so I've told you sort of about the immediate objectives, goals of, of the project. Um, so the ultimate goal of kind of where we're trying to get to here is to help our students build climate literacy. Um, so that they are prepared um, to be effective and responsible citizens, okay? So that they are equipped to uh, develop some, some capacity to discern uh, between a statement about climate change that is uh, strongly supported by evidence, analysis, theory from statements that may be less well supported or statements that are poorly supported that we want them to have the capabilities of making those sorts of judgments and doing that in, in a sound way. Um, and also building their competencies to make good decisions um, in contexts of complexity, of, of um, 
uncertainty um, and understanding that you know we make decisions under uncertainty all the time. Climate change is not unique in that, and you just need to get over it and figure out how to proceed in a way that's responsible and effective, and and figure out how you learn as you go uh, doing this stuff. So that's kind of in the background, sort of the ultimate goal of where, where we're trying to get to. Um, so this project that we've got funded by NASA. Um, uh, we've got uh, the task force members, we've got a few of them here, and I'd like for them to, to stand up. Um, from Dickinson, we've got Jeff Nemitz here, if you want to you know, either raise your hand or stand up. Um, and we've got, uh, let's see, Rob Kuhlman from, uh, i trying to remember, Rob is from Montgomery County Community College. And I guess Sam Wallace, who's here as well, he's kind of been a tag, he wasn't officially on the task force, but he keeps showing up and, and participating as, as, as a member of the task force. And so he, he deserved recognition as well. Uh, Diane McDaniel from Montgomery College. Um, so that's not to be confused with Montgomery County Community College. Diane's come from the distant parts of Montgomery County, Maryland, as opposed to Pennsylvania. Uh, Doug Heath, where's Doug Heath from Northampton Community College? Um, and Julia Knight, who's from uh, Harrisburg Area Community College, she's not able to join us here today. Um, so goals for today. What are we going to try and do in this, this one-day workshop? Uh, basically, what we want to do is learn from each other. Okay, that's the objective today. Learn from each other about the innovative things that we're doing in our classrooms and on our campuses to try and build climate literacy. Um, thinking about that in very broad terms, where we're talking about the physical science, uh, human causes, risks to people and ecosystems, technological, behavioral, and policy options for dealing with with this problem, politics, economics, and ethics. Okay, so all of those things may come into our conversation today. Um, um, so give you a bit of an overview of the day. So this morning, uh, in just a moment, we'll hear from uh, our keynote speaker, Paul Stern, from the uh, National Research Council. Um, and um, uh, then we're going to go into the first of our uh, concurrent sessions. We've got three concurrent sessions um, uh, that are uh, um, organized into three tracks. Um, this is just kind of like fell out from the things that you all submitted, and so trying to figure out sort of how do they sensibly hang together. So one track is science, science literacy and skepticism. Another track is engagement, behavior, and and action, and then the third track is pedagogies for teaching about climate change. So we ignore for a moment that pedagogies is kind of in all the sessions. <laughs> so trying to figure out how to how to how to group and lump these these presentations together was, was a bit of a challenge, but they all look very interesting. Um, we're going to have a round set of roundtable conversations uh, in the afternoon. Um, during lunch, you're going to see um, some um, flip chart paper out there in the atrium area with different topics. So during lunch, we'd like you to sign up for one of those topics. Um, and if you want to create uh, your own topic group, um, uh, we can put up another sheet of paper for people to sign up to do that. Um, and um, those are going to be sort of self-organized things. We don't have facilitators for them. My assumption is we're all teachers here. We're not afraid about talking. We're all able to lead the group. And, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to, to manage to avoid chaos and actually have a, a coherent conversation at, at your table on these topics. Um, at the end of the day, we'll have an open discussion then of just kind of getting feedback on, on the day, some, some idea of, you know, what do we need to be doing about uh, advancing this idea of climate literacy for our students? Um, um, you know, where are we going? What needs to be done on that? Um, I'm going to take a moment here also to, to make an announcement for um, on March 21 and 22. Uh, Dickinson is going to host um, the first uh, Pennsylvania Student Sustainability Symposium. Um, this is a, a, a meeting uh, that's being sponsored by the Pennsylvania Environmental Resource Consortium, PERC. Um, this is the first time that PERC has, has done this. Um, it's going to be an opportunity for students to come and present their academic research, creative work, report on curricular activities they've been involved in, campus projects, community projects, sort of wide range of things that, that they can come and, and share with, with other students from across the state. Um, we're going to put out a call for abstracts in a couple of weeks. Um, you will all get that email, and we really encourage you to pass that on to your students and really encourage them to uh, submit abstracts uh, to come and participate in that. Um, it's open, so it's sponsored by PERC, Pennsylvania Environmental Resource Consortium. Many of you are members of it, some of you are not. Um, it's open to students from not schools that are not members, um, but 
you know, if you want to know why you should be a member, come talk to me. And let's see, we've got some other executive committee members here. We've got um, Kathy Schreiber and Sue Barstum. I'm sorry if I didn't recognize you. And we've got Tim Hawkins somewhere here. Okay, so we've got a number of the executive committee members here. I'm on the executive committee as well. So talk to any one of us about why you ought to be a member of PERC if your, if your school is located in Pennsylvania. Um, all right, so Lindsay will tell us about some logistics uh, here uh, so we know what we're doing and we don't get lost. Um, I'm available today if you have any questions as things come up. Just to geographically orient you, we're in Stafford Auditorium. We'll be in this building all day, so you don't have to go outside. You can leave your stuff as safe on the coat racks. There's no one really here right now but us. Um, so we're in Stafford Auditorium. Rector Atrium is where you had breakfast. Uh, the things, everything will happen in three classrooms. There's one classroom, it's literally on the other side of this wall, in the hallway right behind us. That is Stuart 1113, is on this side. The other two rooms are down this hallway, Tome 117 and Tome 121. And we have white um, tea stands with signs on them, you just need to follow those to the rooms. Uh, there's bathrooms um, on the other side of where we had breakfast. There's a big red wall, and across from the red wall are restrooms. Uh, Dining Services is doing something big for the president today, so we're asked to put our own dishes in the, plus them into the containers today. Um, we will have a morning break and an afternoon break. There should be coffee all day. You're welcome to keep reloading on that as you need. Um, did the Wi-Fi password work? Has anyone tried that? On the some difficulty, which is available. Yeah, this is the one we're supposed to do. Guest. 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 Okay. Let well, me work on that. I did the whole, like, I logged on as me and the yeah. agent texted me uh, an account. But I sent your password. This, yeah. this thing didn't work, but I was able to get on. Okay. Let me check on that during this first session and I'll announce something in there. Sorry, but I've never logged in as a guest. I apologize. Um, we are planning to, unless we hear otherwise from you, record the presentations today. Um, if you are opposed to that, just let us know. The reason being is, uh, one, we had 10 people cancel this morning just because of weather. Everybody's saying, you know, really want to be there, please put this stuff online. Um, we're going to spend the afternoon talking about what this online portal looks like. It's already a powerhouse of really good teaching resources. So an objective of mine today is to um, teach you all how to use that, encourage you to put your own stuff up there today and forever into the future, but I also want to web archive what happens today here on there. So we found a way that it um, records your PowerPoint with you talking over it. So we won't see you talking. We're not video recording, we're PowerPoint audio recording. And those will be posted as PowerPoints, but the nice thing is you can just hear the people talking on there. So myself, um, Kathleen Bansky, and Tice Herman, who also work in our office, one of us will be in each room facilitating that to happen. So we'll start the recording, and then we just need to save the final version of that. So let us know if you would not like that, but the ultimate goal is to just archive for those that couldn't be here today. And in case you need to go back and reference something, you'll have that. Um, yeah, we will talk more on that this afternoon. I guess I'd like Neil is going to introduce Paul at this time. Just let me know if you have any other questions throughout the day. I'll go make a phone call about the wireless. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was really delighted when uh, um, we invited uh, Paul Stern um, to be our keynote speaker today, that, that he accepted and, and uh, is with us here uh, this morning. Um, Paul is uh, a senior scholar with the uh, Board on Environmental Change and Society at the National, National Research Council of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Uh, this was formerly uh, the uh, Committee on the Human Dimensions of Global Change, uh, which Paul uh, has directed since it was uh, since its inception in 1989. Uh, from, from his position at the uh, National Academy, um, Paul has really played a pivotal role in championing the need for research on what has come to be called the human dimensions of, of climate change, or of global change. Um, understanding of the physical science of the climate, of climate change, that's critical, of course. Okay? Um, but climate change has human causes and human drivers. Um, it has human consequences. And its solutions, if we can call them solutions, are human as well. So if we're going to avoid 
uh, the worst projections of what's been called dangerous climate change. All right. We need to, you know, it really requires us humans to understand the risks, to understand how human behaviors can amplify and dampen those risks. Um, it requires us to understand the available choices, um, how decisions are made, or how decisions could be better made. Um, when faced with uncertainty about a phenomenon with such uh, fearful consequences. Um, so, um, you know, this is really a critically important area of work, and I think we should all be thankful to Paul for, for what success he has managed to have, uh, helping others to see that this is an area of U.S. research which has not been entirely neglected. Uh, it's not been uh, funded, I think, as well as, as, as some would like to have seen, but, but I think uh, um, Paul has, has had a role in, in seeing that it has been better funded than it might otherwise have been. Uh, Paul's research interests include determinants of environmentally significant behavior, processes for informing environmental decision making, and the governance of environmental resources and risks. He's co-author of the textbooks Environmental Problems and Human Behavior and Evaluating Social Science Research. He's co-editor of numerous National Research Council publications, and some of those include Climate and Social Stress Implications for Security Analysis, that came out in 2012, Informing Decisions in a Changing Climate, uh, that came out in 2009, Public Participation in Environmental Assessment and Decision Making, 2008, The Drama of the Commons in 2002, and a classic Understanding Risk, Informing Decisions in Democratic Society, 1996. Uh, so those are just a few of, of uh, the really valuable uh, publications that have come out of the National Research Council on, on issues that relate to what we're talking about today. Um, Paul uh, co-authored uh, an article called The Struggle to Govern the Commons that was published in Science in 2003. Uh, it won the 2005 Sustainability Science Award from the Ecological Society of America. Uh, in 2012, he received uh, the Proshansky Newman Award for professional achievement from the Society for Environmental Population and Conservation Psychology. Uh, Paul is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and uh, the American Psychological Association. Uh, he holds uh, a BA degree from Amherst College and MA and PhD degrees uh, from Clark University, all of these in psychology. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Paul and, and ask him to uh, kick off our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a pleasure. I, I look forward to it. an interesting day of being back in a liberal arts environment again. It uh, seems like home. I'm uh, first putting up a sort of a big picture map of what are the human dimensions. This comes from the 1992 NRC report global environmental change, understanding the human dimensions. And as you can see, the, the top half of it is, is sort of the natural science piece. The bottom half is sort of the social science and humanities piece. And there are all of these interactions in between that Neil has already alluded to. This, the implications of this perspective basically are that the physical and social sciences are connected in lots of different ways and that you need all of them in order to understand and deal with climate change, as Neil has also said. Um, and I would argue that the quintessential issues about climate change are at the intersection of all of these fields. I'm going to focus on the bottom half of the diagram, and uh, only, in only in pieces of that, because you can go on ad infinitum with the bottom half of the diagram. But uh, you know, basically, the human causes of climate change and what drives them is in the bottom half of the diagram, the human effects of climate change. Understanding of climate change, which doesn't exactly fit in the diagram, but it sort of sits up above in another dimension, and options for action to address all three of those. So the three things that I've chosen to, uh, to talk about in the hope that it will stimulate further conversation are first of all improving the fundamental ability to understand climate change and think about its implications. You know, for a, for a liberal arts environment, that sort of is the place to begin because it's hard to understand. Um, attribution, I put it in quotes, in the, in the physical science of climate change, attribution is the question of, you know, is it due to human activities? Can you demonstrate that it is? 
uh, I'm using the term a little bit differently, to look at how do you parse the human activities that are responsible <coughs> for the, uh, the physical changes that drive climate change. And um, I'll say more about that. And then policy analysis of re realistic options for limiting and adapting to climate change. So first of all, the fundamental ability to understand climate change and the challenges it presents. Um, teaching climate change, which is the subject of this, includes, as we're already saying, teaching the current state of relevant knowledge in the natural sciences, but also relevant knowledge in the social sciences and, and some other fields. Um, but it also offers an excellent opportunity for more fundamental kinds of education. And it, it really gets down to, and I, I think this may not actually be on the slides, but you know, at the very basic, there is a, a citizenship education issue that climate change is a really good example of. You know, that has to do with how do you establish informed opinions about things that you can only learn about from secondary sources. You know, where you don't have the expertise, you're never going to have the time to have all the expertise that's necessary. You know, how do you develop a solid basis for opinions on public policy issues, acting as a citizen, acting as an individual? Um, I, I cite here a, a paper that Elke Weber and I had an American psychologist a couple of years ago about public understanding of climate change that goes into some detail about why climate change is hard to understand, both physically and, and psychological perspectives on that. And then there are issues about thinking and managing under risk and uncertainty, how to evaluate knowledge claims. Um, briefly, the physical reasons why climate change is hard to understand include these. The causes are invisible, and we're talking about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, primarily. The, uh, the impacts of climate change are geographically and temporally distinct, distant from anything that you do as an individual. You know, we're talking about our grandchildren here uh, to a large extent. We're talking about people in other parts of the world. And the signals are hard to detect. Even the simplest signals are hard to detect. You know, we're talking about slow changes in the averages of highly variable phenomena, temperature, precipitation, uh, storm surges, infectious disease outbreaks, you know, and on and on. These things are, are really stochastic. You see extreme events that happen infrequently, and if they're becoming more frequent, it's very hard to tell. And you get all of these arguments. I had people sending me yesterday stuff about the cold snap of the last few days. And uh, you know, people saying, well, that's it. That proves climate change. You know, I mean, all of this stuff. You know, so the physical fact is it's very hard to detect the signal. If, uh, you know, if you don't, even if you have specialized instruments, it's hard to detect the signal. And in addition to that, it affects multiple phenomena that people tend to focus on one at a time. So you talk about temperature, you talk about precipitation, but you know if you if you understand the natural science even in a rudimentary way, you know that there are a whole bunch of things that are affected, and you know so that the the most critical impacts at a particular place may be none of the things that you think of first. And climate history is an increasingly poor guide to the future because we're dealing with nonlinear change. On the psychological and social side, you know, there is again the challenge of recognizing and understanding change in highly variable phenomena and thinking through what are the implications of change in highly variable phenomena. Personal experience is very powerful. You know, so you get this cold snap and everybody says, oh, well, you know, this has some implication for climate change, but it's misleading. It's hard to see changes in the averages. Recent extreme events carry extra weight. I mean, this is sort of psychologically reasonably well established, what you can remember, uh, you know, weighs more in your calculation than things that you don't think of. And then there are various kinds of emotional reactions to risk and uncertainty. Um, there are simple mental models that people use. I mean, there, there are people who think that if you recycle your, uh, your wastes, that's doing good for climate change. 
I mean, it's doing good for some part of some aspects of environmental quality, but not necessarily climate change. And so you, know, you have these problems that are psychological. You have issues of a cognition driven by affect values and worldviews. I did some work in the 90s thinking about climate change as a new attitude object. And the psychological research on attitudes and attitude change assumes the attitude object. You know, but here you have something that people haven't thought about before, and then the question was, well, how do people form opinions about things that they haven't thought about before? And you know, in our work, we we posited and found some supporting data that people consider their values, and they ask themselves, you know, how might this thing affect what I value, and you know, start to form attitudes based on that. People have different value priorities among different people, and so they tend to form different attitudes. Um, there is also the old psychological work on risk perception that's relevant here, that uh, you know, a lot of risks can be arrayed on a two -dimensional, in a two-dimensional space, where familiarity versus unfamiliarity is one dimension, and, and sort of normal consequences versus, dread, versus dreaded consequences is another dimension. Um, you know, this was used to explain all of the high levels of public concern about nuclear power and radioactive waste management because it was unfamiliar and dreaded. It was associated with nuclear weapons explosions and so forth. Um, and then you can't talk about this without referencing the climate change denial campaign, you know, which is a, a really big issue in terms of why climate change is hard to understand. That there's, a, there's an organized social movement trying to make it hard to understand and trying to you know, perpetuate disinformation and arguments and you know all of this kind of thing. And I, I saw in the program for today people were talking about teaching both sides. And I wouldn't quite put it that way. But, uh, but that is one way to put it. Climate change is a case, an excellent case example. You know, as, as Neil alluded to, we're making decisions under uncertainty and risk all the time. And it is a really good example of that. Um, what you see in the popular press is you see scientists presenting what they claim to be facts, and people on the climate change denial side presenting what they claim to be facts. And there are these disputes about the facts. Uh, people can come to the opinion that the knowledge is established on one side or the other, for that matter. Uh, you know, and other people concluding that there's two sides to everything and we don't really know anything, and they throw up their hands. Um, you know, both of those views are really unsophisticated, and there is a, one of the underlying issues that I see here is about the standards of evidence, that there is a point of view that says that uh, carbon dioxide emissions are innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. <laughs> it's that kind of a standard. And it's a preponderance of evidence standard. You know, legal scholars have all kinds of terms for this. But I think what we're dealing with here is a risk situation. And you can talk about the, uh, the costs and benefits of various kinds of actions versus inaction. And, you know, ask yourself, what's more at it under what we know at this time? You know, I mean, I think the uh, the innocent until proven guilty idea, you know, it assumes that there's there's no downside to a false acquittal, and you know, it's it's sort of hidden under the debates that there are some people saying, well, you have to have absolute proof, otherwise you're justified in doing nothing. Um, so we actually have data, we have projections, we have risk estimates. But there are some issues there. You know, we, we know more about the past than we know about the future, obviously. And, you know, but there are ways to assess knowledge claims both about the past and about the future. The ones about the future require more understanding of the scientific basis. You know, what are the climate models based on? And what kinds of projections can they offer with what levels of confidence? And so forth. And this is why you know, those of us in the social sciences need the natural sciences to help with that. Um, I was engaged in a discussion on an environmental sociology listserv a few weeks ago 
um, where there were people arguing back and forth about some of this climate stuff. And it, it sort of shocked me at one point to realize that none of these sociologists was talking about the role of social institutions in adjudicating facts. But you know, science provides a set of social institutions for validating knowledge claims. You know, and this, this is an important thing to think about in the education of people who are not going to be scientists, you know, to understand how science works. Because if you understand how science works, I think um, you would know that if some scientist came up with a knowledge-based argument that blew the theory of climate change out of the water, uh, that person would be famous forever. You know, and, and the fact that that hasn't happened, you know, is, is information for me when these claims come forward. So, you know, it's, it's important in, in the social sciences and science studies and so forth to talk about, you know, what are the social institutions that science uses for validating knowledge claims so that you can read critically. And, you know, there's, there's work on this in the sociology of science and other fields. You know, and among the characteristics are openness, independent peer review, protections against conflict of interest, you know, open debate, you know, so on and so on, you know, all, of, all of this kind of stuff. And in the, in the policy arena, there are also institutions for validating knowledge claims. They're, they're similar and also somewhat different. And uh, you know, the, the understanding risk report from the NRC that I was involved in talks about that to some degree, and I've written about it since. You know, and there's a, there's a list up there about uh, some of the characteristics and you know in in some environmental areas it's important to as it said in understanding risk not only get the science right but get the right science and sometimes you have situations in which non-scientists ask questions that scientists haven't thought of but really need to be investigating in order to get at you know, the, the full implications of a process like climate change or a new technology or so forth. And you know, there are characteristics of those institutions. Society also has a set of institutions for governing risks and for managing uncertainty. And, you know, if you, if you look at a little bit bigger picture of what should society be doing about climate change, you, you have, and this is this is a recent. This is a list from a recent paper of mine. I don't think it's a final answer to anything, but uh, I thought it was a step forward. And you know, if if you or your students are thinking about you know whether our society is is organized in a way that it we'll make sure to get the best relevant knowledge together, learn from experience, you know, and so forth. Uh, it's important to think about the governance institutions and their, their capability. And I'll mention especially for this regional group, my most recent project at the NRC was two workshops that we held in 2013 on risk and risk governance issues and shale gas development that uh, is going to wind up with a, a special issue of environmental science and technology in the workshop report. And, you know, a lot of issues in that risk governance arena that, that this list is particularly relevant for. But that's a little bit of a sidetrack, except that I'm in Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, on the matter of human causes of climate change, uh, you know, this is sort of a standard causal model that you know, driving forces, human activities, leading to physical changes that change the radiative balance of the planet. Um, physical changes forced by greenhouse gas emissions, changes in the planetary albedo, and so forth, um, is the physical side that needs to be understood. The human activities that directly cause those things, that drive the, the, the activities, fossil energy use, deforestation, you know the list. Um, when you get down to the driving forces in human activities, it gets more interesting for the social sciences. You have the old uh, 
Ehrlich and Holdren IPAD equation, impact equals population times affluence times technology. Um, some of my colleagues in sociology have been trying to unpack that with regression models where you try to measure these things and you know, put weights to them. And of course, it's different depending on what level of analysis you're using if you're doing it globally by like nation states or, or whatever. But um, the drivers operate at different scales, different disciplines are needed for different drivers. And there are a lot of interesting questions for scientists and for students to work on here because depending on how you account for the, the drivers, you go off in a lot of different intellectual directions. If you focus on activities like driving cars versus driving forces, income levels, automotive technology, regulatory standards, and, and so forth, leads you to different questions and leads you to different disciplines to find answers. If you start with a discipline, you look at it in one way versus another way. Um, scales of analysis lead you to different things. I mean, if you're looking at global, you, you're talking about IPCC and international treaty obligations and so forth. If you're looking nationally, there are different questions. If you're looking at the community level, it changes again. One interesting thing that um, I noticed recently because of a paper that came to my attention a few weeks ago in the journal Climatic Change was that a lot of the accounting has typically been consumption-based. I mean, what are the uh, greenhouse gas emissions per country? Or what are the greenhouse gas emissions from a household or from a community? Uh, this new paper by Rick Heed, I don't know how to pronounce his name, um, allocates by producers of fossil fuels. And it says, you know, I, you look at the producers and what's the list of the top producers? And I will come back to this issue of, of attribution as an accounting exercise, which is what I'm talking about now, and attribution as an ethical or moral, moral issue, which we also need to talk about, but they're connected. You know, the, the ethical questions are, uh, you know, the ethical, I say, you know, what ought one to do questions are different depending on what kind of accounting you do. So in this new paper, looked at CO2 equivalent emissions from producers of fossil fuels and cement, which is not just embodied energy, but the process releases carbon dioxide, and quite a lot of it. <coughs> it reports that the top 90 producers account for 63% of cumulative worldwide emissions from 1854 to 2010, yeah, which is sort of amazing. The top 10 account for 38%, and there's a list of the top 10 cumulative emit emitters and a list of the top 10 emitters from 2010. And if you if you look at the bottom list, you'll see, I can't, this is my phone. I'm sorry about this. I'm not going to answer this. I don't know who it's from. My wife is up at the hotel and not feeling well, so I said, call me if you need me. It's not for her. Um, if you look at the bottom list, you'll see that you have to go down to number five before you get a privately owned energy company, which was a, you know, not a shock to me, but it's interesting to see. You know, but that has some implications if you say, you know, who's responsible? Whose behavior do you want to change if you want to reduce emissions? Um, but in, in a bigger sort of pedagogical view, it makes a difference whether you look at the producers or the consumers. You need to look at both, of course. Um, issues raised by producer-based accounting. What different policy options for mitigation are suggested? Whether you're talking about allocating responsibility to producers or consumers. Yeah, so you look at international analysis, you think about treaties, you can look at cons you know, policies to reduce consumption of individuals, of organizations, of governments. Um, if you look at the producers, then you start thinking about interventions by stockholders focused on corporate managers. You, you know, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, they left a message. Um, 
and so you know, it leads you to think about different policy strategies. It leads you to think about different kinds of analysis that would be worth doing. Some of them are things that students could probably do. Um, and it gets to a question that I'm going to come back to in a few minutes here about uh, you know, how, could, how could you credit these, these producers with investments to reduce the drivers of climate change. So, you know, as, as I suggested, each accounting system implicitly assigns responsibility. I mean, there's, there's accounting sort of responsibility and then the implication of moral responsibility that people might draw from it, either to producers or consumers, to countries, to regions, to, to what level. And each one of these suggests different kinds of handles if you want to reduce climate change impacts by reducing drivers. Um, if you consider impacts, also, you know, then there are more actors and there are more responsible people. If you look on the, uh, on the adaptation side, you know, who built the floodplain in the first place and, you know, all of those sorts of questions. So, you know, there, there are topics here for philosophy as well as for policy analysis, economics, and, and a number of other fields. Okay, finally, policy analysis of realistic options, and they're normally divided into mitigation and adaptation. I have more of an interest in mitigation, although adaptation is obviously important. We're going to need it no matter how much mitigation we do. But if you don't do the mitigation, adaptation needs to multiply. I have a 50th reunion coming up at the end of May at Amherst College. And the organizers of the reunion had this wonderful idea to ask us 50-year people to think about our legacy. You know, they're, they're framing the reunion discussions around uh, the question of the world we inherited and the world we will bequeath. You know, and this is great for people of about my age who are thinking about those sorts of things. There are going to be three conversations based on what people were interested in, one on education, one on environment, one on government. I agreed to be one of the co-organizers of the environment discussion. And there are six of us from different fields. There's, there's a lawyer and an oceanographer and a couple of ecologists and somebody who's discipline, I can't remember, of me. And we decided that climate change was the preeminent environmental legacy issue for our generation. It's the thing that, as, I, as I'm putting it in my letter to the classmates, if you think about what our grandchildren or their grandchildren might say if they said, why didn't you do something to prevent the situation that we're in? You know, we, we thought that climate change was at the top of the list. I mean, we don't know what it's going to produce, but of all the things that are going on, that's what we want to focus on. And then the question is, what can we do to improve our legacy? We decided to focus on mitigation over adaptation because it has more legacy implications. What you do lasts for centuries. And we're in the process now of looking for a sweet spot, by which I mean you know, the, multiplying the impact of an action by the probability that we can make it happen. There are things that you can do in your personal life that make a difference, but it's minuscule. And there are things that could be done at a national or global level that would be really important, but do we have any way to move the, air, move the, you know, move the situation? And I, we are putting to the class, to the class Think of things that have the highest probability of impact times the probability, the highest product of the impact times the probability that we could make something happen. And we have so far thought of one thing that might fit in the sweet spot, divestment from fossil fuels you know, at the college level. You know, we might be able to influence the college. Um, it's been proposed at many colleges. I hadn't heard about it until I was talking about the reunion with somebody who's not an Amherst alum who said, you know, they have these divestment movements. Oh, that might be just a ticket. 
Um, I'm not aware that this has ever been proposed by an alumni group, and I don't know whether my group is going to do it. It's been usually proposed by students, occasionally by faculty. Um, you know, and I imagine that the trustees would have questions if we do this. And there are, there are, there are social science questions here, right? Would it have any effect? You know, I think immediately of, of South Africa. You know, and with South Africa, it was clear what the government had to do to get out from under the sanctions. It's not clear what ExxonMobil would have to do. You know, stop being an energy company, you know, what would it do? So, what would it cost the college's endowment? People have studied that, you know, that from what little I've seen so far is that it's not terribly costly. Um, how would you decide what to divest in? There are movements to divest in coal, there are movements to divest in all fossil energy. How do you pick which companies uh, could a company get credit for doing better? You know, a lot of these are integrated companies and they have investments in renewable energy. And they'll say, we well, you know, wait, we're investing in renewable energy. Well, you know, enough to matter. You know, could you set up criteria? You know, how could a company get off a divestment list? You know, so, and, the, and there are more questions. And I'm just making the point that, you know, if you're thinking about this, and if you're in a place where there is a movement, there's a lot of research to be done. I haven't done it yet. You know, some of it is college specific. I was talking to Neil at dinner last night, and he was saying something about how Dickinson's endowment is invested. They don't control the investments. It's invested with a, you know, with a fund manager, and they have criteria. You know, so it, it gets complicated. You know, there's an economics agenda there. I'll just say I have I put together. I think it's just one slide on adaptation. Um, and you know, of course, extreme events are a major motivator for people to do something and to motivate people to to focus on adaptation. Um, they're a major subject for analysis. Resilience is a major subject for analysis. And I will mention again to this group, as I did to Neil last night, that uh, I was teaching at Elmira College in upstate New York in 1972 when the remnants of Hurricane Agnes came through and flooded Elmira and Corning in New York, Wilkes-Barre and Harrisburg in Pennsylvania, and, uh, you know, it was a mess. And, you know, my impression, we still have our home outside of Elmira, so I go up there frequently. My impression is that Elmira never recovered. Corning did. I don't know what happened in Pennsylvania. I have some Wilkes hypotheses about what? Looks very good for the government. Uh -huh. And Harrisburg, as the state capital, maybe did somewhat better mm -hmm. because they had a big anchor industry there, as did Corning. You know, and Elmira lost its uh, two major fire engine manufacturing companies. I don't know where they went, but they no longer make fire engines in Elmira. And the state tried to bail them out from a terribly high unemployment rate by building them a second prison. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's, there's research questions here about, about adaptation and resilience. And I, I mention it because, you know, we're all in the Susquehanna Basin. And uh, there, there are case examples. I was talking over breakfast about the, the general issue that there's a lot of work in the qualitative social sciences to be done, both on the adaptation side like this, but also on the mitigation side. You know, social movements for divestment and other kinds of things like that. Under what conditions are they effective? You know, people who want to be engaged, they want to be engaged in something that has a decent probability of success. So how do you evaluate that? You know, you know, I think the methodology is probably comparative case analysis. And there's a list of references that I mentioned. I've probably run out of time. <laughs>
I don't, I don't know the answer to that. You know, is that feasible? Uh, I don't, it, you know, it's a good question. There's a lot of good questions here. And, you know, what, I, what I'm trying to do in this opening thing is open up a lot of questions. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's the problem you know, with... You take control. You can move it away from fossil fuels. You know, then you're really talking about, and maybe so, I don't know. You know, I mean, what do they have the capability to do? So, you know, a company has, it has capital, it has people, and, you know, I'll put it in another way. You know, these companies compete with each other. They do diversify. They make choices about how to diversify based on, on their sense of, you know, where they can get a better return on investment. Some of them are doing some of that. I don't know why some of them are doing more of it than others. You know, but um, if you know more about that, you might have some insight into, you know, if you took over a company like that and you told it to do this, would it just fall apart or would it actually do it? You know, I, you know you're shaking your head no. Well, I think there's not enough good guy money in the world to take over the stock of the major, yeah, you're talking largest about major companies in the world. Investors. You're talking about pension funds, down. you're talking about yeah. sovereign wealth funds, you know, you're talking about you know, really big money investors. You know, so uh, they're they're question, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I wonder, a lot of you people are probably participants in TIAA Craft. Now, there's a major institutional investor, mm -hmm. you know, that, that college and university faculty might have some influence on. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you want to go that way, there's some research to do. <laughs> but it's an interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, about this uh, divestment campaign, uh, is, has it had any success so far? I know Harvard refused to do it. It was an attempt to get Harvard's uh, yeah. administration to there, divest, and the president said no. Uh, Bill McKibben at 350.org, I think those folks keep track of what it is. There, there have been some. I don't know how many. You know, I understand that Hampshire College divested from something or other. Um, you know, the the Cornell Faculty Senate voted for a you know approved a divestment proposal that takes in a couple of decades. Yeah, there's stuff going on. I mean, I'm just wading into this. It's got to hit those universities with the largest endowments uh, at first. Obviously. Well, I mean, there's that. Yeah. There's things yeah, so, like so far, the, uh, the, the schools that have um, decided to divest are have very small endowments. They're places like College of the Atlantic, Unity College, yeah. um, um, yeah, those sure. kinds of things. Yeah, and so, yeah. Hampshire. So, um, we've not seen this happen in a place with a large, large endowment. Um, this point, I might suggest that um, when we're thinking about uh, roundtable discussions for later today, maybe put this up there on a chart and have people sign up of whether it's divestment or maybe the broader question Paul posed of as you're thinking of legacies and that I times uh, probability of what are the list of things that one might want to engage and participate in to have the biggest yeah. product of impact times and probability. Is it divestment or is there yeah. something else? And how would you evaluate which are the which are yeah. the low hanging fruit for that? Yeah. In this setting it will be pure conjecture informed by well, a little bit of knowledge yeah. this afternoon <laughs> and, and that'll entertain us and, and maybe then take us into something more productive later. <laughs>